So uh, welcome all to this new reading group session organized by Continual AI. Today we have the pleasure to host Han uh, Gok Tai uh, from uh, the uh, University of Georgia, right? Georgia Tech Institute, right? Um, the see if my, okay. yeah, Georgia Institute of Technology. Sorry, uh, talking about the paper. Uh, does continual learning equals uh, can destroy forgetting? So thank you so much, Anne, uh, for being here with us today. And please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Hi. Uh, thank you, Vincenzo, for inviting me to this uh, talk. And uh, I will start sharing my screen. Everyone can see my screen now, right? Yes, yes, we can see it uh, full screen, uh, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, my name is Anne Tai. Um, I'm a second year PhD student at Georgia Institute of Technology, advised by Professor Jean Ray. And uh, today, uh, thank you again, Vincenzo, for inviting me to this talk. I will present my uh, recent work, Does Continual Learning Equal Catastrophic Forgetting? And so, I'll start with uh, a brief introduction of continual learning. So I guess everybody here is very familiar with continual learning. So what is standard continual learning? Uh, the learning procedure is the following. So at each time step, uh, we first choose a category from a pool of, of, uh, of category without replacement. And then we show this category to the learning model. And the learning model trained continually uh, on, this, uh, on this category or set of category with uh, stochastic gradient descent. And then we test, we test the recognition accuracy uh, of the category seen up to that point. So this process repeat uh, until the category is exhausted. And with the, with the diagram on the right, we are showing that uh, various uh, state-of-the-art continual learning models, and we can see that catastrophic forgetting uh, where the where the uh, performance is uh, decreasing over time uh, is still an issue with the standard continual learning as compared to the joint model, which is like the green line above all these lines where the model is trained on all the same data as once. So uh, our contribution in this paper is the following. So we have the uh, continual, lo continual learning paradigm where at each time step, the model gets to see a subset uh, of, of, of categories. And then uh, we, so in that setting, but we, we do it with reconstruction task. So we show that uh, continual learning with reconstruction task do not suffer from catastrophic forgetting. Uh, and this is like uh, the normal contribution uh, which has not been investigated or shown or de demonstrated in any prior works. And with this, so uh, we, we hypothesize that the uh, learning representation is robust uh, with like when learning uh, on the reconstruction task. So we try to use this representation and perform uh, a very simple uh, classif classification on top, which is the nearest class mean to do the classification. Um, and then, so, and so we do show that uh, the feature, feature representation learned in reconstruction task can be used as a proxy task for, 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 for classification. Uh, so with that sense, we identify the key ingredients for uh, learning a continual learning classification task. And we show that a very simple algorithm, uh, which we call YAS, uh, achieves state-of-the-art uh, performance and outperforms uh, state-of-the-art methods. And uh, so we and we finally show, uh, we finally demonstrate a, a visual tracking tool to uh, visualize forgetting of uh, the feature, the feature, uh, the, the feature representation and the output class prediction. So uh, all these contributions uh, are under the theme of, of understanding continual learning and uh, providing a uh, deep investigation into, into continual learning. 
and we hope that like our work will uh, encourage the community to rethink uh, and to investigate more problems in continual learning. Uh, so first, uh, I will go into the details of uh, continual learning of single view 3D shape reconstruction. So what is 3D shape reconstruction? Uh, single view 3D shape reconstruction is a problem where the model sees an input image, as in uh, this uh, the first diagram here. The input is uh, is an image, and then uh, it outputs like a 3D representation. So it can either be mesh, voxel, or uh, the very recent uh, uh, very recent uh, 3D representation that are used in a lot of uh, single view 3D shape construction is the SDF or implicit uh, representation. Uh, so this representation is lightweight and uh, uh, can produce uh, more details than other mesh voxels. And the data set that is uh, used a lot in 3D shape reconstruction is ShapeNet Core V2, which consists of 55 classes of 52,000 instances. And this uh, data set is the largest shape data set to date with category labels. Uh, and uh, so I want to further emphasize that uh, a lot of uh, 3D shape reconstruction uh, works use the only the largest classes with around like 40,000 40,000 instances uh, and uh, this uh, discard the other 42 classes with fewer uh, instances in, in per class. But in this work, we will show uh, results for both for 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 both uh, the 13 largest classes and uh, all of the 55 classes of ShapeNet. So uh, we found in our paper that single view three shape construction does not exhibit catastrophic forgetting. We test this in two settings. So the first setting is single exposure, which is uh, for each class is seen only once. So this is very similar to the standard uh, continual learning uh, paradigm. And for each learning exposure, uh, we show to the learning model five classes. And each learning exposure is trained to conversion. So we, we train 500 epochs for each learning exposure. And uh, this is the result of uh, uh, of the two state-of-the-art 3D reconstruction uh, algorithm adapted for continual learning uh, uh, over the time. And uh, we can see that the performance uh, does not degrade and it also exhibits like a slightly increasing trend. Uh, although uh, there's still a gap between the batch performance and the continual learning model performance, but uh, we have not seen this phenomenon uh, in any standard continual learning of classification uh, before. And the second setting that we test is the repeat exposure setting. So in this setting, each class is seen multiple times. So in our experiment, we show uh, each class 10 times to the model. And in this setting, we only show one class at, learn at each learning exposure. So similar to the single exposure case, uh, each learning exposure in this setting is also trained to conversions. So this is the result uh, for uh, multiple state-of-the-art uh, methods on uh, uh, with repeat exposure. So we can see that with repeat exposure, uh, each uh, like uh, the uh, the red curve, which is the sorry the SDF net with the ground truth depth and normals as input. And uh, the blue curve, which is the SDF net with uh, image as input, uh, was able to reach the batch. And uh, this is uh, very surprising. Uh, so these results in uh, the 3D shape construction is very surprising because uh, it seems like uh, the 3D shape construction is not suffering from catastrophic forgetting and with repeat exposure even can reach batch. Yeah, so uh, we can see here that like uh, the the two state of the art methods uh, adapted for continual learning can reach the batch performance. And then we also present the uh, experiment on uh, the 2.5D sketches estimation. So uh, in this paradigm, uh, the we use EURESnet 18 
and the input image is the RGB input image. So we will predict the uh, surface depth, uh, the surface normal, and the uh, segmentation mask of, 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 of the object. And uh, we, we show here uh, the result in the single exposure case. So similar to the previous setting, single exposure is, is, uh, is that like, each class is seen once, and we only show one class uh, for learning exposure to the model. So we can see here that uh, the performance of the silhouette prediction, uh, the higher the IOU is better, is uh, uh, going up and uh, eventually very close to the batch at the end. And the performance of depth and normals is measured uh, using the MSC loss. And uh, we, sh we, we can see here that like for the depth MSC, uh, the loss is going down and, the, the mo and for the normals, uh, the loss is slightly going down. Uh, so we can see here that like for the silhouette, the depth and normals prediction, uh, catastrophic forgetting is not an issue in this, in this task as well. Uh, and uh, we then show uh, the result on uh, image autoencoding. So uh, among all of the reconstruction tasks, this is the easiest task. Uh, we'll show you the result for single exposure case. So uh, uh, each class is seen once and we present one class to the to uh, per learning exposure to the model. So the total learning exposure here is uh, 100 because we are evaluating on 100 categories of CFAR. And uh, uh, the, uh, the metric that we use is the MSC loss. Uh, so we can see here that like the loss goes down and it stays down after around 10 loan exposures. And we also show here the example of uh, the reconstruction uh, result uh, of the model at different loan exposures uh, of the first, the very first class that the model sees. So the uh, green batting box here is the ground truth. Uh, and uh, each, uh, each uh, image uh, with the red arrow here showing that, for example, at exposure 20, the model is able to create, uh, to reconstruct this image. Uh, and uh, we can see that like all of these three images are very identical uh, to, to the ground truth image. Uh, the, like, and note that the model does not have a chance to see the uh, first class ever again, because this is like a single exposure case. So uh, yeah, so we can see that like this task, uh, image autoencoding, also does not exhibit catastrophic forgetting as well. And it's worth noting that all these reconstruction tasks are trained with uh, normal SGD, and we don't use any example of memory or any heuristic as, at all. Uh, so the result is pretty surprising that uh, catastrophic forgetting is not happening in this uh, task. Uh, one empirical find that we found uh, is that it is beneficial to propagating learned representation uh, in, in, in shape reconstruction. So uh, the result here is that we, the red curve is that we trained with a random uh, initialization at every learning exposure. So at, at every learning exposure, we reinitialize the weights of the models and train from scratch uh, with the current with the current uh, training data. And the yellow curve is uh, we initialize the uh, learning the, the the learning model at each learning exposure with the weights from the previous uh, learning expo learning exposure. So it means that. Uh, uh, the 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 model at the next learn exposure uh, can benefit from or like be harmed by the representation learned in the previous learn exposure. So we show here that actually uh, learning with the weights initialized from the weights of the model in the previous learn exposure is actually beneficial to shape, uh, which eventually shows a, a big gap between uh, the, the the yellow and the red curve. And but but also but this is not the case of classification, uh, as we see no uh, no uh, benefit between uh, random 
within every uh, between the representation forward transfer and the random reinitialization. So uh, we think that this is one of the property of the sh uh, of the reconstruction task that can that might help with not suffering from catastrophic forgetting. Uh, so we we have seen from from the results above that repeat exposure is beneficial for both classification and reconstruction task. So for classification, this has been mentioned before in the uh, incremental object learning for continuous views of CDPR 2019. Um, and now we show this phenomenon on the construction task as well. Um, and uh, but we we are not yet sure why this phenomenon is happening. So I think in the future work, it is uh, worth investigating or like the reason why reconstruction tasks do not exhibit catastrophic forgetting. We just show like one result that uh, propagating the uh, representation learned uh, in the previous exposures is beneficial for a shape task. And the potential limitations of, of this, uh, of these results, are that the 3D shape in the 2.5D sketches, uh, they use synthetic data. But uh, this is still like a very challenging task uh, since we show that for 3D shape, uh, the uh, the batch performance is not uh, high. It's, it's like it, the 3D shape reconstructions algorithms do not achieve high performance in even batch mode. And this is uh, potentially one of the other limitations of these results because uh, it might be the case that the algorithms themselves are not are not very well performed so that we can uh, understand very deeply into the catastrophic forgetting or like the behavior of, of the algorithms in uh, continual learning. Um, yeah, so after uh, identifying that like reconstruction tasks do not suffer from catastrophic forgetting, we, uh, we, we, we try to see if like this uh, robust representation learning is beneficial to classification. So what we do is that we train uh, a, 3D, a single view 3D shape reconstruction, uh, CSDF net, and then we freeze all the weights. So we perform a forward pass to get uh, to get the feature representation and perform nearest class means uh, on top of the feature representation. So the paradigm is shown here. So we, we do a forward pass, we get uh, the bottleneck we get to the bottleneck, which is the feature representation, and then we perform nearest class means. Uh, we only store 20 uh, examples from the training set to for each class to perform nearest class means. And this is what we find. So the proxy representation learning, which is uh, the blue curve here, is uh, like performing on par with the state-of-the-art met uh, classification method. Uh, without being trained on a uh, category label for the feature representation learning. Uh, this, this finding is surprising, and uh, we think that this is uh, a potential for rethinking whether we want to train uh, a robust feature representation for classification learning without, like, without having uh, to train with discrimination laws of the FC layer. Uh, in that sense, we identify the key ingredients for uh, yes, uh, so to to for classification task, and we introduce yes, which stands for yet another simple baseline. So this is inspired from uh, a very recent paper called GDOM, which uh, which illustrates that like a very simple algorithm can actually outperform a lot of state of the art classification algorithms. So the philosophy of, of YES is that uh, it is built on a batch learner. We incorporate some of the following details so that uh, YES can be adapted to continual learning. So we perform data balancing uh, because uh, when uh, training on the current training data and the example set, there's a, a data imbalance between the uh, dominant of like the current training data with a very small size of example set. So for this, we uh, use weighted gradients, which is uh, we weight the uh, we weight the gradients disproportionate to uh, the 
the uh, to the amount of to the size of the training data uh, to 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 the size of the data of that class. Uh, and for the exemplar memory, we uh, perform a random selection, uh, which means that like at, after each learning exposure, we randomly uh, select from the training data of, of the current class to form the exemplar memory for that class. And the important thing is that uh, the exemplar memory is fully utilized. So what this means is that, for example, we have 2,000 exemplars, and after the 91st concept, each class has 21 exemplars due to the integer division, and this leaves 89 exemplars remain. So uh, if we don't use these 89 exemplars, we are lacking 89 exemplars that, uh, re that we are not using all of the available resources. So what we did is that we divide these 89 exemplars into the first eight night learned concepts. So in general, each each class will have like a very similar number of exemplars with uh, some class having one more exemplar than the other classes. So this way we can use uh, to the full like to the full resource that we have. And what we can see from this is that yes, I perform state of the art algorithms. So in this setting, we show uh, the single exposure case of yes where we learn only one class exposure. So this is a very challenging setting uh, because uh, the model gets to see only one class with uh, less discrimin discriminative and less uh, less discriminative signals and less uh, data uh, during training. And we only have, uh, we only show here uh, 500 examples, which is only 1% of the training data. And uh, we perform uh, three runs of these algorithms. Uh, yes, which is the blue lines, uh, consistently outperforms all the other methods uh, with very uh, small, uh, very small variation towards the end. And uh, so in the end, we want to understand uh, what is uh, the cause of catastrophic forgetting in, uh, in classification tasks. So we present DIRT, uh, which stands for Dynamic Representation Tracking. So uh, what DIRT uh, does is that we have the, uh, we use the final uh, feature representation of like the final, of the model at the final uh, time step as the ground truth, um, which we denote here as uh, YT. We by, uh, minorize that uh, feature representation within uh, with respect to a, a threshold. And then for class prediction, so after the average pooling, uh, the feature goes into uh, uh, an FC layer and produces class outputs. For VF, uh, which stands for visual feature classification training, uh, we also have a, an FC layer, which produces an outputs. Uh, and then we use a VCE loss to compare with the VF targets, which is the binarized uh, feature uh, at the uh, of the model at the end of training. So what we found uh, is that using DIRT, we can see that class forgets it's actually four times more significant than VF forgets. So we can look at the uh, area under the curve here. So the light uh, pink purple curve is the class is the output class forgets. And the uh, the darker purple curve is the VF class forgets, and we can see that the VF class forgets is significantly less than the and then than the output class forgets. So what this means is that uh, the feature representation learned is actually more robust and more and less prone to catastrophic forgetting than the FC layer uh, or the classif classifier itself. So this aligns with the findings from uh, previous works that uh, the FC layer is Tend, tend to be the problem of uh, classification learning in continual learning setting. So uh, for this work, we answer no to the question we pose uh, in the title. So does continual learning equal to catastrophe forgetting? No, because we can see that like in for some for reconstruction tasks, it does not actually happen. But also this is also depending 
on the task and the setting. So for uh, example, for classification, uh, for uh, repeat exposure, we have seen that uh, the performance can actually reach the batch performance. Um, and we also show the potential of utilizing the feature representations learned in the shape reconstruction task for classification uh, using a very uh, naive or, or like simple classifier, which is the very class means. Um, we also present a very simple baseline called YAS that outperforms state-of-the-art methods. So this raised the question of uh, uh, do we need to rethink catastrophe for, uh, to, to rethink uh, uh, classification learning in continual learning? And uh, like, uh, should we should we learn like a more robust feature representation uh, instead of like learning end-to-end -end model with uh, cross entropy loss? And uh, at the end, we uh, present DIRT, which is a visual tracking tool for understanding the representation learning of uh, continual learning models. So DIRT can be used on any uh, models that uh, have like an intermediate representation learning phase. Uh, and uh, we can like use DIRT to, to visualize uh, the amount of forgetting uh, of the representation learning and compare that to uh, to the output of the FC layer. Yeah, so uh, that's uh, the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna uh, get a question if anyone want to ask. Oh, totally. Uh, thank you so much, Anne, for your very interesting presentation. I think that indeed, uh, indeed it, it, it uh, suggests uh, a couple of very, very interesting evidence and points that you raised. Uh, I think that will be very useful for the rest of the continuing learning community. So thank you so much for, yeah. for working on this. And um, so there was one question in the chat. Maybe we can start from that. Um, so there's uh, Aditya Rabal who is asking, instead of, of weighted gradients, I guess, for the yes, uh, baseline, why not lower the learning rate? Instead of, of yeah of uh, yeah weighted gradients as you explained before. Uh, so the question is uh, why why we don't lower the learning rate? Is yeah, the, I think he is asking. I mean, I mean, uh, Aditya, if you're here, you can open your mic and clarify your question. Uh, but yeah, I think he is asking why to actually weight the gradient instead of, of changing the learning rate the learning rate instead i see uh, so uh, uh the purpose of uh of the uh, weighted gradient is that we are making sure that each class contributes uh equally the same to the uh, to to the back propagation so uh, uh i think there are like a lot of uh, ways that we can do that but we chose weighted gradients because it's like a very Simple is well established method to uh, to to uh, tackle uh, data imbalance. So yeah, so that's why we use graded gradients. Right. So um, uh, maybe I can ask one question. Uh, I was uh, very surprised to see, especially the um, out encoder experiment on uh, Cipher. It was in Cipher, right? Uh, yeah. If you go back to slide. Exactly, this one, uh, because I mean, it seems that I mean, especially looking at these uh, images, right? These are the reconstructed images, right? Yeah, the one sure. OK, right. So it seems like they're they are very high quality and seems to, to work well. Um, so again, here in this scenario, you show to the model for each of uh, uh, I mean, uh, of these steps, let's say of these different updates of the encoder. Only one class, right? Yeah, only one class. And then for okay, and and this this one class that you see at one particular point, you don't see that again in uh, in this future, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay, and then so okay, so yeah, so uh, the images on the second row uh, is the reconstructed uh, example from the very first class. So the class that the model sees at, uh, at like exposure zero. So uh, the model does not get any chance to see the class again, but uh, it still 
uh, performs very well on these test yeah. images. Well, this is uh, this is I mean very interesting. I think because oh, uh, what many think of people, including me, uh, were thinking is that. Uh, I mean, if the data distribution is changing, then the model, even though it's doing like this unsupervised task, maybe even very general, uh, that is reconstructing image, it should be able to specialize on, on what is actually trained on, right, on, on a particular step. So, for example, is should be able to, should be like specialized to reconstruct a particular, particular images of a particular class. Um, so it's, it's indeed very strange that the, you know, the knowledge about the past is not destroyed. Uh, and so what I, I'm thinking uh, is, uh, yeah, well, maybe in this particular data set, I mean, the, the actual distribution of, of these small images is not that different. Uh, so I was wondering, but do you think that this uh, kind of, as a, this, this exact same scenario in a different, on a different benchmark, maybe on a larger scale or with a different, let's say, distribution for all, maybe more separated distribution for each of, of the classes would uh, obtain the same result? Or, or do you think uh, this is not that general uh, in terms of, um, yeah, expe expectation we can expect from, from this kind of setting without encoders? Yes, yeah, so uh, so we, we run this on, on, on CEPA 100, which is, uh, a hundred like a hundred learning exposures yeah. because we only show one class for learning exposure. Yeah. So I think it's like it's a very challenging uh, setting because by the like by the end of at 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 the last last step you didn't get to see a lot uh, like ninety nine other classes. Uh, and we have also also seen that like classification performance on this data set is not doing well as well. So it I I don't think like this image autoencoder part is due to the data distribution. It's more like the inheritance, uh, the the property uh, of, of, of this task. So we have a hypothesis here that actually this uh, reconstruction task is actually learning to map uh, for this image autoencoding, for example. It learns to map like a local patch on the input image to a local patch on the output image. So uh, the patch you see like the upper left corner here and the patch you see the lower right corner here does not uh, contribute, like does not uh, influence the, the model to make the decision. Uh, I think the important part is that the model, because of the receptive field size, it just needs to know the neighborhood uh, of, of this patch. So for example, I have like very dark color here. Uh, and it does not have to know that this patch needs to be yellow. So I think that's why one of the one of the reasons that like uh, catastrophic forgetting is not happening for for the image mm -hmm. autoencoder. Uh, while in classification, uh, you need to see like the whole image. So to 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 learn that this is like an apple or something instead yeah, yeah. of just looking at like a small patch. That's a very interesting uh, idea. But uh, indeed, it, it means that these I mean this kind of um, autoencoder, this model is not actually able to learn like a hierarchical and robust representation of these objects. Uh, it's just finding a trick uh, to, to map again uh, in that particular uh, input uh, space, uh, the, the, what it, it sees. Uh, 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 yeah, you know, uh, yeah, without actually uh, learning a semantic representation of these objects. So in fact, in fact, did you try to, for example, use these, the representation built by this autoencoder core classification uh, to see, I mean, not if it's competitive, I think that, yeah, uh, probably, you know, uh, classification uh, in a continuous learning setting with replay is, 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 is more effective, but at least if it's like doable, yeah, so I think uh, for the proxy task that we also talked about, it's not like we can use any intermediate representation to do classification. So you're right that like for this autoencoder, we can explain exactly why the perform like the performance is is not catastrophic. Uh, uh, for forgetting uh, because of that, like the local mapping. Uh, so uh, I think we have tried using the intermediate representation of this autoencoder 
on classification, it did not work. Uh, but for uh, the more complex task like 3D shape of construction, uh, I don't think like we know or we understand 100% what's going on in the model. Like, is it learning local patches? Is it learning like globally, semantically? Uh, mm -hmm. And for that, we we we're still able to use the uh, intermediate representation to learn an effective classification. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's that's very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, Fun. And uh, yeah, also about the YAS uh, baseline, I didn't quite understand what you mean by batch, uh, yeah, batch learner. Uh. Yeah, so uh, batch learner here yeah, refer to uh, a standard, uh, a standard uh, uh, classification algorithm which use uh, cross entropy loss. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we we built on this philosophy of just extending the standard classification model uh, and like not using any heuristics. Okay. So essentially you're using the external, let's say replay buffer plus the current batch. Yeah. And then you train with this uh, basic uh, data balancing strategy plus uh, random selection for the example memory. And also, yeah, that's it. Yeah, right? yeah that's it. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. I mean, uh, it's like you said, it's a, uh, it's useful for everyone of us uh, working, you know, uh, trying to design new prototype, new computer learning algorithms, and uh, it's useful that, to know that uh, this is a uh, competitive, uh, maybe even better than GDAM, uh, if I remember from the plot that you showed. Uh, but yeah, uh, something yeah. that we can can easily implement and uh, and use as base as a baseline to see yeah. if we are actually at least be able to to beat that. <laughs> so thank you again, uh, Han. Uh, so do we have any more questions uh, here uh, from the audience? All right, so I don't see any more questions in the chat or uh, people that are actually um, asking. Uh, but uh, so uh, I think that uh, I can close uh, this session uh, now. And uh, of course, I uh, remind all of you here that we do uh, a reading group session every week um, at the same time on Friday. So. Thank you so much for, for being uh, with us today, uh, to all of you, and especially Han. Um, and of course, if you want to, Han, to, to share your slides, you're free to do so uh, in our Slack uh, workspace or just send it to me and I will upload it on our forum as well. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me to this talk. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice weekend, all of you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye.